This is the journaling workshop, and I have a confession to make before we get started. I was a reluctant journaler, man. I, I used to make commitments all the time to be more consistent and then try to keep it up for maybe a couple of weeks, and then I would stop. Then people would share about journaling and how good it was for them, and I would commit again, wishing that I was more consistent. But you know what? I really wasn't. I was off and on at best, using different mediums, different types of journaling, different prompts. And today, I'm more consistent. So what I want to share with you today are some of the things that helped me and worked for me. So if your journaling isn't that consistent, or even if it is, I hope that uh, you'll be able to take away at least one thing that will help you get better at journaling. Okay, so let's get started. Just a quick roadmap today. Uh, we'll be covering some of the benefits of journaling, then some of the misconceptions that I ran into personally, then I'll go through some basic tips and tools. So let's start with a question. Um, why journal? Why journal at all? You probably heard that it's a great way to organize your thoughts and to reflect, and that's one way to answer the question. But another way to approach this question is to ask, what would happen if I didn't? Well, you may have already started to notice that um, you have mental clutter or you're distractible. Uh, there's this astonishing statistic that comes up from time to time that modern people now have a shorter attention span than the common goldfish, which is on average about nine seconds. We're just not very good at focusing anymore. And I find that there's so many things that could distract us from TV to movies to the internet, social media. I mean, so many distractions. Uh, and I could totally imagine going for weeks, months, or even years without making any sense of the events in my life and my responses to those things. Now, this isn't a, a talk about how the internet is evil, but I do think that we need to be aware of its effects on our capacity to reason at a higher level. So I want to show you a video that talks about how all that works. Okay, as an exercise, why don't you try to summarize what that video was about? Try to reconstruct the main arguments with the person next to you if you're with someone or on your own by making some bullet points. I'll give you about 20 seconds for that. Okay, time's up. Here are the main points of that video, and hopefully you got something like this. First, that constant access to technology, namely the internet, it leads to perpetual distraction and interruption. Constant distraction and interruption prohibits uninterrupted contemplation, which then prevents memory consolidation, that process of ideas going from short-term to long-term memory. And over time, the lack of memory consolidation leads to the loss of the very capacity to learn to think deeply, to think meaningfully. So how many of you would relate to that um, feeling of being constantly plugged in, bouncing from app to app, from task to task, connection to connection? I think this has an effect. It builds up a habit, a lifestyle where we never get to hit pause. We never get to take time to just stop and to think, to ponder over our lives. And you know, in time, if you live this way for five, 10 years, what do you suppose happens? In her 2008 book, Hara Murano, editor at Psychology Today, says that college students these days seem to lack a fundamental skill set, critical thinking, being able to decide to solve problems. And she says that these are all skills located in the frontal cortex, the executive portion of the brain, and these skills hinge on reflection. And that's what journaling is about. It's about reflection. Uh, which is about um, evaluating, right? The, the, the relevance and validity of information. And if you don't have enough of it, you probe for more. And then you analyze, you, you marshal evidence and you develop hypotheses based on reason, judgments, or ambiguous information. You formulate inferences, calculate likelihoods, and envision alternate strategies. In other words, you generate new ideas based on the information that you get. And she says that these skills, they're absolutely essential for analyzing problems and identifying solutions. The book that I'm talking about is entitled Nation of Wimps. And basically, the author's main idea is that if we don't pay attention to these things as individuals, we're going to lose the ability to regulate emotions. And, you know, whenever there's a crisis like a COVID pandemic or the wildfires in California or hurricanes in the Gulf states, it's all going to be too easy to be overwhelmed to the point of paralysis. The less we reflect, 
the likelihood of us becoming a society of wimps is actually pretty high. So the stakes are actually a lot higher than we might imagine. We have to journal. Another way to describe these the skills, it, it's emotional agility. And this is actually the title of a book by Dr. Susan David, professor at Harvard. She was doing research on this topic and she kept seeing this name, right? James Pennebaker. Well, turns out he, he's a professor uh, at the University of Texas. And he's still there. She, she contacted him to see if there was some chance to collaborate. She wanted to know about his story, his, his background. Well, it turns out that he had been fighting depression. Uh, and that's where it all started. One day he just started to start writing about all the stuff in his head just to organize his thoughts initially. Maybe it would help to catalog all the hurts and pains and brutal truths. So he wrote about all of those things, his marriage, parents, his career, his hopes and aspirations, even his fear of death, everything. So here's a quote of her describing him in her book. As he wrote um, and continued to write in the days that followed, something fascinating happened. His depression lifted and he felt liberated. He began to reconnect with his deep love for his wife. But the writing had an even further reaching impact. For the first time, he started to see the purpose and possibilities in his life. Can you imagine that? And it sparked a 40-year span of research for James Pennebaker. Susan David continues to write um, about herself now. She says, when I first discovered Pennebaker's research, I was struck by the way it echoed my own teenage experience, journaling about my father's cancer while my father was dying. And then when he was gone, my life was painfully different. And the writing helped me voice my regret about all the time I hadn't spent with him and all the things I hadn't said. I also wrote about the moments I didn't regret and how I'd done the best I could. Through that writing, I learned to sit with all my emotions, both the pleasant and unpleasant ones. This in turn gave me insight about myself, the most important revelation being that I am resilient. I realized that I live with my full self, even the parts I'm not so thrilled about. Dr. David goes on to analyze the benefits of reflective writing. Um, she mentions in her book that when people reflect, we develop what she calls a meta view. That is a third person point of view of ourselves that allows us to stop being self-centered and self-focused and more receptive to input from others. It's the power to evaluate and judge with proper scale and context where trivial things don't get too big and important things aren't dismissed. The idea is that you're not your thoughts. And that makes sense, right? A quick way for me to remember it is that um, I have all these uh, funny thoughts in my mind. Doesn't mean that I'm funny though. But this idea is actually really powerful when you consider that you can have all these negative thoughts about yourself, like you're not good enough or you're ugly or, or your friends don't like you. You know, you are not your thoughts. Interesting because one thought that I had about myself is that I'm not a journaler, but it turns out that that's not true. At the persistent urging of others, I tried it in earnest and experienced the following benefits. I had improved memory, I had better comprehension, greater emotional resilience, self-discipline, my writing got better and my mind became uncluttered among other benefits. But you know, these aren't things that are unfamiliar to scripture. The Bible has been declaring the benefits of putting the mind to the test for thousands of years as if to anticipate our current age. Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 12, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So journaling, um, it seems to provide a pathway to discerning even what God's will is, what's good and what's acceptable and perfect. And that seems to be a consistent theme in scripture. Lamentations 340 tells us, let us examine our ways and test them. Let us return to the Lord. And Psalm 119, 59 says, I've considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes. And finally, Jesus' own words in John 8, 32, and you, will know the, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Ultimately, journaling allows us to get to the truth, the reality about our situations, circumstances, emotions, our very lives, and where we stand before God so that we can turn to Him and be forgiven to live a life that is rich and full of abundance and joy and freedom that comes from God. And ultimately, that's the why. That's the why behind journaling. So, okay, so we, now that we have the why, uh, before we get to the what, I want to get through some of the, the misconceptions. I often get surprised at the false notions that people have about 
reflection and journaling. And I want to share with you some of the misconceptions I had. Maybe you'll be able to resonate with some of these. First, that journaling is not just sitting down to fill page after page of colorful language to describe your emotions and feelings. That's not what it's about. You know, I was wondering where I got that, though, and I think it's from a quote I heard once. Wordsworth, he says, um, fill your paper with the breathings of your heart. Now, I'm a man of few words, and I don't have no breathing of my heart. So it's really intimidating to hear that, right? This quote um, actually looks like this for me. Uh, and empty pages are just really menacing, you know? And I feel like I'm under under the gun, under pressure. And I would ask myself if there was something wrong with me because there just wasn't anything coming out. I certainly wasn't feeling anything, so why would I write about nothing? Well, that's a false notion, of course. Um, while description and analysis of emotions is involved, that's only part of the picture. Next thing that journaling is not is dwelling in the past. Well, if there's a lot of things backed up that you haven't been able to process, journaling, um, you, you, when you start to journal, you, it could seem this way at first. But what I found is that because we're finite beings, guess what? The backup is also finite. And while the dwelling in the past aspect might be there at first, I found that this begins to taper off at some point. Thoughts become more about the immediate past with occasional excursions into something that happened during childhood or something. But eventually, my thoughts became increasingly about the future, my goals, my aspirations, hopes for myself and other people, relationships, everything. I mean, it includes stuff from the past, but it's not only the stuff in the past. Next, journaling doesn't have to be written for anyone but you. A false notion I had was that one day someone's going to be reading my journal, so I should make it beautiful. Well, it doesn't have to be beautiful or beautifully written. No one's going to be reading your journal. No one cares that you can't spell embarrassed. There are two R's and two S's, by the way. Or how embarrassed you felt that you couldn't do something. So once I got over the fact that my entries didn't even have to be grammatically correct, didn't have to be free of spelling errors or that it even needed to make sense, I began to write more freely and I found it interesting that over time, my thoughts even tended to become more coherent. My grammar and spelling improved. My penmanship just got better as I journaled. But what if I end up sounding too random? Well... Uh, the entries might ramble at first because, you know, you're not used to exercising that muscle. And that's okay, but it's not okay probably to stay that way. And if it does, you might want to get a mentor who can help you and coach you. But I find that in most cases, self-correction tends to kick in at some point, And it's just a matter of exercising that muscle, finding a time and opening up your notebook. A notebook? Well, what about a computer? I found that writing at the computer was actually what was contributing to a lot of my randomness and incoherence. I thought it was just me, but I'm running into study after study, and the consensus is that writing on the computer is great for dictation, but it's not so great for hashing things out and pondering. Writing on the computer doesn't provide enough time to consider thoughts long enough. I think paper and pen uh, seems to work a lot better for that. And this common sense observation turns out to be something that authors have known for a long time. In 1985, uh, there was a Paris Review article. Uh, novelist Robert Stone was asked if he mostly types his manuscripts, and this is his reply. Yes, until something becomes elusive, then I write in longhand in order to be precise. On a typewriter or a word processor, you can rush something that shouldn't be rushed. You can lose nuance, richness, lucidity. The, the pen compels lucidity. Next, narcissism, and that's a bad word. Um, journaling seemed to me essentially so narcissistic, I, and I chafed at the thought that I'm just going to be writing about myself, what happens to me and what I'm feeling. Well, there's something to that beca because there's a lot of about me when journaling, but remember, um, narcissism actually refers to an unhealthy, exclusive self-admiration, like the rich fool in Luke chapter 12. His narrative reads like a rather narcissistic caricature of a bad journal entry. Luke 12, 17, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. It's interesting that here he's taking stock of himself. I, me, my, um, but I don't want to be like this guy. 
But consider this, what conclusion does he arrive at? Is it, is it to treasure the word of God or to prayer, to fellowship with other people? No, it's all about goods, relaxing, eating, drinking, and being merry. That's actually what I don't want to be like. He's so sad, right? Trying to feed his soul with things that will never satisfy his soul. Like typical modern day 21st century people. All manner of materialistic pursuits, pleasures, and escapes. Indulging in all forms of mind-numbing entertainment. Ultimately smug, proud of himself, with no regard for God or anyone else. No regard for the poor who could benefit from the rich harvest. Nor any gratitude towards God who, could, who provided the rains for his crops to grow. Just the raw, self-congratulatory monologue filled with selfish plans for himself. And that's what I don't want to be like. The guy who says, eat, drink, and be merry. He's completely unaware of the real danger of a hollow soul or the judgment that awaits him that very night. Well, the problem with a guy like this rich fool is that he stopped too soon if he journaled at all. There, there are beginning signs of what might have led to brutal honesty, but he stopped shy of realizing something significant and got distracted by the enjoyment of the harvest. If this man just stopped to consider and to think about what he was really saying, if truth was the objective, it might have actually turned out differently. At least there would have been a chance. Maybe he would have discovered himself. Maybe there would have been a recognition of, his, of certain patterns in his life. His smugness, patterns that Jesus ultimately calls not being rich towards God. We all have patterns. Personally, I'm often a little too critical of myself. And through journaling, I see these patterns emerge here and there, and it prompts me to make a greater effort to celebrate certain things and calibrate my heart and give proper thanks to God. So those are the misconceptions. All right. Misconceptions um, and the reasons why we should. Uh, what I want to cover now is how these things play out in real life. Some journaling tips and some tools. Let me just get one thing out of the way. I find that for the majority of the time, about 90 to 95%, a list of feeling words. Happy, angry, anxious, sad. A list of these words combined with the prompt yesterday is enough to get me going. There's usually at least one interesting conversation that I had or a general feeling that I can recall. Sometimes, well, a lot of times, I'll start with yesterday I felt grumpy, but you know, I'll sharpen it more. I'll try to turn it into a description of behaviors and reactions that help me dive deeper. So many days, you know, I'll start out with I felt grumpy, but then by writing about what I did or what I said or how I responded, I realized that my grumpy behavior was actually the result of some fear or anger or sadness. But what if I can't remember anything from yesterday. Well, there's a great little way to get the memory going. It's called bullet journaling, and it's a list of things that would happen yesterday, right? That might help trigger some of these thoughts. I woke up, washed, talked to my wife, went to work. I had devotions, worked on my sermon, ran into so-and-so in the kitchen, and I had a conversation with them. I met a student. I had dinner. I went home. I went to bed. You know, I might remember a thought I had when I was brushing my teeth, getting ready for bed. Maybe I got a little annoyed that my wife interrupted me in the middle of my thoughts. So I was not as friendly. I, I might write about that. Why is my thought life more important to me talking than talking to other people? What does it say about me when, when I do stuff like that? What does Jesus say about something like that? Next, choose your weapon. And this is a matter of personal preference. It's all about choosing the right notebook. Moleskins are generally associated with journaling, and they're really nice. People love them. But, you know, I have to say this about them. It's a little bit too claustrophobic, not big enough. I like a lot of space so that I can do whatever I want with that space. Doodle, diagram, make side comments, whatever. But especially when I think I have a lot on my mind, I want a lot of space to write in, even if I end up not using all of it. Just the thought that I am not limited. Something that my engineering professor said, um, paper is cheap. What he meant by that is that we should leave enough room for corrections that we might want to make later or for him to make comments. But it's useful in journaling because sometimes you might come back and want to write down the resolution of an entry thought or thought in, in uh, a previous entry. But you're not going to be able to do that if your notebook is too small to accommodate that, which might cause you to never write down the thought in the first place. Um, anyway, the next tip is timer. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said about having a deadline, at least for me. I need that extra little bit of structure. Otherwise, I might drift in my thoughts and, you know, not be able to focus. And then a whole hour passed by. But with a timer, um, you're going to develop discipline and more like muscle memory. Eventually, you might not even need a timer at all. Next, 
sometimes I would get a thought in my head that's really absurd. It, I wish it would go away like a song lyric that I, you know, from a song in the 80s or something, right? But more seriously, right, it might be a phobia or fear or anxiety that keeps popping up and it just won't go away. So, you know, what I did was to, instead of trying to fight it, I would just start writing about it, describe it, name it, analyze it, and talk about why it's so absurd. Like I did with that song from the 80s, right? There was this song called Shout, right? And I was writing this, all the screams of pain shouting out in my mind because all the stuff that I went through during that time in my life, right? It's something that I could do without. So come on. But, you know, later I journaled how I wish I memorized verses instead of nonsensical song lyrics like these. And then my random thoughts would be, a, even my random thoughts would be a space that God owned and not a group from the 1980s, right? And finally, focus journaling. There are times when the thoughts and feelings and issues you're dealing with are complex or embedded enough that one day's journaling is just not enough. What I want to say about that is that it's completely okay to journal over a course of several days about the same topic. That's completely okay. For example, if you're struggling with some dark thoughts, perhaps what is most needed is for you to focus on the things that you should be grateful for. So the prompt for that would be something like, I'm really thankful to God for something, right? So that your mind is focused on the things that you're thankful for rather than have them being colored with your dark thoughts. So here are some other uh, prompts that might be really helpful if you need help with um, self-awareness, for example. You might want to journal for a while with the prompt, what does it feel like to be on the receiving end of me? Or if you need to work on your capacity to listen, uh, you might just simply want to do a recount of a particular conversation for uh, a few days in as detailed a manner as possible. Or if you want to work on your empathy, you could journal with the prompt, what does it feel like to be so-and-so these days, choosing a different person for each day? The idea, again, is that you don't need to limit yourself to 30 minutes in order to arrive at a resolution. I mean, your life is not a sitcom. Remember that journaling can be used to get your heart ready to face the day, uh, to hear from God, to have the right posture before Him, uh, rather than being distracted by a host of thoughts and feelings. So that's pretty much it. The whys, the hows, and some misconceptions of journaling, some tips and tools. I just want to encourage all of you to try it. And if you start it, keep at it. Because it's not a nice to have in your life, but a vital part of spiritual life. And I hope that this workshop was helpful because ultimately journaling is going to help you take real ownership of your, over your spiritual life. And you're going to thrive in your relationship with God. That's my prayer and my wish for you. That's it for me. Um, how about if I pray for us? Let's pray together. Father, we just really want to thank you so much for giving us uh, your word, giving us these tools with which we can approach you and approach uh, the day, approach um, just relationships in general with the people that you placed in our lives. Lord, you've given us so many blessings. You've given us the gift of reason. And I just really pray, God, that you would help us uh, to use that reason and the, the capacity that you get, gave to us uh, to deal with our emotions, to deal with the circumstances, and be able to come to you in truth. We just really thank you so much for this time once again. We thank you for one another, and I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, thanks for staying on, and I'll see you later.